fever and difficulty breathing are both known symptoms that can arise from a COVID-19 infection. Some people suffer long COVID, where they have extreme fatigue and cognitive difficulties. But doctors are still finding out why. It could be that the virus moves through the nervous system of people it infects. That's what new research suggests. And that's research we're going to be looking into later with an expert who studied the neurological impact of COVID-19 on patients. But first, let's zoom out. What happens to the human body when infected by the coronavirus? We know much more about that now than we did at the beginning of the pandemic. Take a look. It's not just coughing and sneezing that are dangerous, but also speaking and singing. Tiny droplets and aerosols loaded with the virus float invisibly through the air and are inhaled. Coronaviruses can reach the mucous membranes in the throat and nestle in there. This is the beginning of the infection. Then come the symptoms, but those aren't that unusual for most people. They might feel like a normal cold. A runny nose, a cough, feeling sick, fatigue, high fever, it can all be there. Another thing is a loss of taste. Most infected people, around 80%, will have mild symptoms which go away after a few days. By this point, our immune system has successfully fought off the virus. It's like this in a lot of cases, with bacteria and viruses. Only in a few cases does a serious infection occur. But coronaviruses can multiply fast, spreading from the throat to the lungs. And that's how they can infect lung cells until pneumonia sets in. If severe pneumonia occurs, it means the gas exchange is disrupted where oxygen absorption takes place. And so the patient needs supplementary oxygen. That's by definition a severe COVID case that needs to be treated in hospital. The body is supplied by oxygen via the lungs, entering the bloodstream via the alveoli to the blood vessels. And then it is distributed to the rest of the body. Complications can occur when the coronavirus settles in the space between the pulmonary alveoli and the blood vessels. That can cause inflammation. The distance to the blood vessels then becomes greater and oxygen intake is more difficult. When organs are deprived of oxygen, breathing is labored. And then respiratory muscles are quickly exhausted, especially in the elderly. That's when the lungs need help with a ventilator but that can't prevent the situation from worsening in some cases. Inflammation in the lungs increasingly hinders gas exchange. Fluid escapes from the cells. And even with the support, not enough oxygen enters the body. Then an external machine must take over the function of the lungs. The so-called ECMO enriches the blood outside the body with oxygen and then returns it into the body, but not without complications. The ECMO isn't free from complications. You can have bleeding complications and many more. So this is really a therapy that you use when your back is up against the wall and only in special facilities. But it can be a life-saving therapy. But the situation can escalate even further. The immune system then becomes the main problem, triggering a massive inflammation as a reaction. We need an immune response to actually fight the virus successfully. But the immune system can react so strongly that it ends up creating a bigger problem than the virus itself. Defense compounds flood the entire body. Immune cells attack the inner walls of blood vessels. They become weak, Fluid leaks into the tissue and is deficient in the circulatory system. The organs are no longer sufficiently supplied with blood. But while most COVID cases are mild, the recuperating phase can cause some concentration problems, exhaustion and muscular weakness. And that tends to be more severe than in other infections. 
We usually see the post-COVID syndrome in younger people who weren't seriously ill with COVID at all, but they can't seem to get back on their feet. They're really exhausted and can hardly get up on their own. So we have top athletes who can't even manage to climb a staircase without being short of breath. Progression to severe cases is now less common than during the first wave of the coronavirus pandemic. This could be due to mask usage. It may contribute to a smaller amount of the infection in the air, making the disease less deadly. Now, there's the long-term effects of COVID on your body, and that can include the impact on the brain. To help us understand this better, Frank Hepner is joining us now. He's the head of the neuropathology department at Berlin Charité University Hospital. Welcome to you, Frank. Now, there is increasing evidence that SARS-CoV-2 not only affects the respiratory tract, but it can also impact the central nervous system. What is the likelihood of that happening? Well, we know from one third of the COVID-19 cases that they do suffer from neurological problems. And this was basically the reason for our study, where we asked actually, so how is the distribution of the virus in the brain? And secondly, how does it get into the brain? Now, one third of coronavirus patients, that is a significant proportion, means it's definitely worth looking into how SARS-CoV-2 enters and invades the nervous system. What can you tell us about that? Well, we knew that there is a virus, uh, of course, within the olfactory mucosa, so the mucosal layer um, beneath our nose. This is where we do the swapping. So we knew this is a, an, a kind of potential port of entry. And we know from other, other viruses that they use uh, the cranial nerves for example, the olfactory nerves to climb up to the brain. And this is what we tested. We took uh, basically regions from the olfactory mucosa and we took different parts of the nerve and we looked into uh, the respective connections in the brain. And indeed we found with different methods that the virus uh, apparently uses the olfaction, the olfactory nerves to get into the brain. What does this mean in terms of long-term damage? What do we know about that? Well, this is, of course, a difficult question. I mean, we looked at um, very severe cases that died from COVID-19, and uh, these had different uh, times and durations of the disease. And, uh, of course, it is difficult to um, assume or um, even anticipate what's going to happen if there is a longer period of, of time of the virus um, in the brain. But what we can say is that the fact that the virus gets into the brain and then may distribute there, even to regions which are very sensitive for our bodily functions, is of course something that we have to um, take into account when we uh, make diagnosis, when we think about treatments. And the fact that there is uh, this high incidence of neurological problems means that apparently that uh, many of the COVID patients um, have the virus within the brain. But do you know if there is a way to prevent that from happening? Well, of course, right now, uh, not. What we did is just to diagnose or to make this uh, diagnostic approach to learn how the entry is. And this kind of is um, the typical approach in, in medicine and in life science research. We first have to understand what kind of cascades are used, for example, in this case, for, from an infectious agent, to learn about the potential bottlenecks to then know where um, to interfere uh, later on when we have something at hand to tackle the, the virus. Thank you very much. Frank Hefner heads the neuropathology department at Berlin Charité University Hospital. Thank you very much for your insights today. And now we've come to that part of the show devoted to one of your sent-in questions about the coronavirus. Our science correspondent, Derek Williams, has an answer. Which COVID-19 diagnostics are most useful from an epidemiological point of view? There are basically three types of diagnostics that play useful but different roles in the fight against COVID-19. Um, the first two 
are for determining whether someone has the disease or not. Um, the gold standard for doing that is what's called a polymerase chain reaction or, or PCR test. Um, it works by amplifying tiny amounts of any viral genetic material available in a sample um, up to levels where it can be detected. Although no test is 100% reliable, um, PCR tests are very accurate. O on the downside, they're also slow and, and fairly expensive, which is a drawback when numbers of cases are rising rapidly. Um, the second class of detection diagnostics, called antigen tests, work by detecting viral proteins directly. Um, antigen tests are cheaper and they can deliver a result in minutes, but they're also less accurate than PCR tests, which is a particular problem when it comes to what are called a false negative results. That's when people actually have the virus, but because the test says they don't, they don't isolate. Still, the speed and, and low cost make antigen tests important tools in scenarios where infections are spiking and, and a lot of people need to be tested quickly. And they can often be performed on site, so samples don't have to be sent off to specialized labs. Um, the third diagnostic in the COVID-19 pandemic that's playing an important role is, is what's called a serological test, generally called an, an antibody test, which detects proteins called antibodies that form in the body as part of the immune response. Um, they can tell doctors if someone was infected, at least in the recent past. Um, serological tests also play a key role in vaccine development since they can show whether a candidate is having the effect that we want, which is to prompt the immune system to produce antibodies.